Good morning. Good morning. We're going to get right into it. Uh, if you've got a Bible, uh, go, to, go with me to Psalm chapter 13. Uh, for those who are new, might be visiting with us, um, you're kind of jumping in in the middle of a series that we're in called Summer Soundtrack. Uh, we're, really what we're doing is we're just kind of parachuting down into different parts of the Psalms. And, and the reason why I say different parts is that the, the book of Psalms is a collection of 150 different songs, poems, and prayers. If we wanted, uh, we could spend 150 weeks in this series, but I just thought that might not be the best way to, to spend all of our time. Uh, so what we're doing is in, instead of taking the next three years out in this series, we're, uh, we're, we're just looking at different categories of psalms. So far, we've looked at psalms of praise, psalms of petition, psalms of peace, psalms of pilgrimage. And today, we're going to look at psalms of pain. Just turn to your neighbor and just tell him this is going to be fun. <laughs> just tell him. Yeah. Now turn to your other neighbor, the one that you conveniently ignored the first time, <laughs> and just tell them, I don't think it's going to be. <laughs> Psalms of pain. Psalm 13 is a short psalm that we're going to be in today. It's only six verses. So what I want to do, I want to read it all together. I, I want you to kind of feel it like as a whole, and then I'll pull some stuff out. But here it is, Psalm 13. It says, how long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death and my enemy will say I have overcome him and my foes will rejoice when I fall. But I will trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. This is the word of the Lord. This here, Psalm 13, is one of many psalms of pain. And there's some stuff we know about this psalm and some stuff that we don't know. Uh, what we know about this psalm is that it was written by David. Uh, like many of the Psalms we've been looking at, uh, David uh, was king over Israel. Uh, David was a, a big figure, biblically speaking. Um, he's the one who wrote this. But, but again, there's some stuff that we don't know. We don't know why he wrote this. Uh, and, and i I, I got to be honest, as somebody who kind of studies for a living, that kind of frustrates me. Uh, like this week, I, I was, as I was kind of getting into this Psalm, I was trying to figure out like, like, what was the pain that was driving these words? And, and people guess, right? Some think it was when uh, David uh, committed adultery with Bathsheba, slept uh, with her, impregnated her, killed Uriah, and then the baby died. Uh, it's, it's possible. Others think it was when Absalom, his own son, uh, kicked him off the throne and then tried to kill him. Well, for others, they think, uh, quite possibly, it was before he was even king. It would have been one of the many times that Saul uh, tried to kill him over and over and over again. But the reality is we don't know. We don't exactly know why. And although there's a little part of me that's frustrated in that, uh, the, the more that I've sat in this text, the more that I'm starting to see the beauty and the ambiguity. Because regardless of what David was actually dealing with here that, that caused these words, regardless of what the specifics were, most of us in this room have been in a season like this. And what I mean by that is most of us in this room have been in a season of deep pain. Dare I say, crisis. Right? I, I think one of the ways that you can tell uh, whether or not you're in a just a, a kind of an uncomfortable season versus like a, like a crisis season, one of the ways that we can tell is that you have far more questions than you have answers. David here has far more questions than answers. I mean, just look at it. He says, how long, Lord? How long will you forget me? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts? How long must I have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? David is in very real pain. 
Psalm 13 offers far more questions than it does answers. I'm wondering, have you ever been there? You, 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 you ever been in a season like this? You, you, ever, you ever been in a season where like the question to answer ratio is just like through the roof? This is where David's at. Like, like, like far more questions than answers. Maybe, maybe you're listening to me right now and you're a college or university student and you went off to school only to find out that your parents are now getting a divorce. And that separation has left you with far more questions than you have answers. Maybe it's sickness in the body, pain that you deal with every day, and the uncertainty about the future has left you with far more questions than you have answers. Maybe it's your kids who aren't loving Jesus, or maybe it's the fact that you can't have kids. And the infertility has left you with far more questions than you have answers. One of the sure tell ways to figure out if you're in a season of deep pain, crisis level pain, is that you have far more questions than answers. I, I, I think what I want to explore today in our time together is simply, what do we do when we get there? And we will get there. I mean, it was Jesus who said, in this world, you will have trouble. Like, I love all of us who want to like claim the promises of God. Anybody claiming that one? <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> Jesus says, no, this is going to happen. You're going to, in this life, experience deep pain. I'm not talking like a frustrating moment or a hard day. I'm talking seasons of life where everything gets flipped upside down. What do we do when we get there? How do we, how do we deal with sometimes what's like life's just vicious curveballs? Well, Psalm 13, this Psalm, I, I think what it's going to do is it's going to give us some really practical steps. Uh, what I want to do, I, I want to pull out three different things out of Psalm 13 that I think are going to help all of us. Uh, whether or not you're just walking out of a storm uh, you're in a storm or you're about to be in a storm. Like I said, we're all going to be there. We're all going to get there at some point. So we better well learn how to deal with it in a godly way. So if you're taking notes, uh, I, I want to pull three things out of this. Here's the first thing. The first way that we process deep pain is this, that we need to be honest with God. You need to be honest with God. Like, I, I don't know... When it happened in church history, but somewhere along the line, it, like, it almost became a badge of honor the more emotionless we become. Especially sometimes in more like charismatic circles where we, like, we think that, that the only emotion that we can bring to the Lord is, are like the good ones, right? Like, like bring the happy ones, bring the smile, bring the joy. Like that's what God can apparently handle. Can, can, can I tell you, God can handle whatever you have and more, okay? Like, that's not how David rolled. David wasn't afraid to be honest with God. David brought all of it to the Lord. The good, the bad, the ugly. I mean, Psalm 13 here, and it's not, like, it's not just the questions, right? I mean, he starts off, how long, how long, how long, how long? But it's not just that. Look at verse three and four. He says this, Look on me and answer, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes. Most theologians think that line right there is almost like David is experiencing a very real depression. And he's asking God to lift him out of it. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death and my enemy will say I've overcome him and my foes will rejoice when I fall. I mean, do you hear the emotion do you see the honesty in these words? David's not speaking in some nice King James voice. It's like, will thou please look upon me and answer? No, like this is David almost grabbing God by the collar saying, I need answers and I need them now. See, what David's doing is what theologians call a lament. A lament is a powerful, 
emotional discharge that reorients our hearts and our minds around God. When we lament, uh, when we take all that hurt and that pain and the confusion and the anger and we bring it before the Lord, the Spirit of God moves powerfully. But the opposite is also true. When we refuse to bring all that stuff on the inside, when we refuse to bring that to the Lord, but instead we just turn to other friends or post on our socials or whatever, like I promise you, that pain will eat you alive like a cancer. Because you're not dealing with it in a godly way. And if we don't deal with our pain in a godly way, your pain will deal with you. It will process you. Like, like the first way that we actually need to learn how to deal with that like midnight of the soul season is we need, to, we need to be honest with the Lord. We need to bring all of it before God. All of it, all the hurt, all the confusion, all the anger, because it's actually in that space that we make room for the Spirit of God to move. Some of us, man, you're continuing to go through the season because you're not even giving the Holy Spirit a chance. <laughs> You're, 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 not, you're not creating space for, for God to move. We're, we kind of bought into this lie that we have to hide how we feel before the Lord, and that's just not true. You bring it to him, all of it. I mean, this is what the Psalms show us over and over and over again, is that there's not one thing that you will ever go through in your life. There's not one emotion that you will ever feel that you cannot bring before God. The first way that we move through pain, deep pain, is that we need to bring that before the Lord. But that's not the only way. Uh, Psalm 13 doesn't end in verse 4. The, the second way that we get through deep pain is this, that we need to be mindful of God. Now let me just try to explain this uh, for a moment it's important that when we're going through deep pain to let what we know about God trump what we feel about God. You hear me? Like, yes, it is absolutely right for us to bring all of our emotion before the Lord. Yes and amen. But it is not right for us to let that, to let that emotion drive us. Your emotions can't drive you. Truth must drive you. Okay? I'm going to tell you something that might just blow your mind. Okay, ready? What you feel isn't always true. Okay? Some of you are like, what? No, like, just take it in. Your feelings lie, <laughs> okay? Like, what we feel is not always true. This is why, like, like our, our feelings, we need to bring that before the Lord, but our feelings can't drive us. Truth must drive us. David doesn't spend all of his time lamenting. He doesn't. He spends a lot of time lamenting. He spends a lot of time emotionally discharging, but, but, but what he does is he turns into remembering the facts about who God is. Yeah. Look, look at verse five. He says this, but I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. David is saying, man, like, yeah, let's just call it what it is. My life's a mess. He says, my life's been flipped upside down. I have far more questions than I have answers. But then he turns and he says, but I'm going to trust in his unfailing love. That, that, that phrase, his unfailing love, it's the exact same word that we looked at two weeks ago. It's that Hebrew word, hased. Let me hear you say hased. Hased. Hesed, to me, hesed is one of the most interesting words in the entire Bible. It's, it's this Hebrew word that we really don't have any adequate English equivalent for. So scholars, you know, debate on like, how, how do you articulate this? How do you, because we just, we just don't have a word for it. And, and the, the best we can come up with is that it's the unconditional covenantal love of God. It's the type of, of love that keeps on giving even when we don't deserve it. This week, I, I wrestled with whether or not to show this, but, but I, I, I think it's really going to help us kind of see what, what, what David, I think, was processing in his mind. There's a photo. If we could just throw it up. Th this here 
is the uh, 1996 Time Life photo of the year. Uh, the, the black woman there is an 18-year-old uh, named uh, Keisha Thomas, and the white man on the ground was a member of the KKK. Uh, for, for those who, who don't know what the KKK is, uh, the Ku Klux Klan, it is a vile movement fueled um, by hatred and, and violence and racism. And in 1996, in Ann Arbor, Michigan, not far from here, there was a rally being held uh, by the KKK. And not surprisingly, a group of protesters came in close by to um, protest the event. And I'm not exactly sure how or why it happened, but that man on the ground left the rally and he started walking in the midst of the protesters. Again, I have no clue why he would do this, but he went right in the midst of the protesters, and eventually somebody noticed that he was a member of the KKK, and um, they called out over a megaphone, and that whole group of protesters very quickly turned into like an angry mob. They, they grabbed the man, they threw him to the ground, and very quickly uh, people came in, uh, with sticks on their signs and different things, and they were about to beat this man. Uh, when several have recounted this event, uh, the anger and the tension in that moment was so high that very likely could have ended with this man's death. But it was in this moment that the most unlikely person stepped in, Keisha Thomas, who jumped on top of him not to hurt him, but to cover him from the ensuing blows. I gotta be honest, when I first saw this, I had a lot of questions and a lot of emotions going on. Um, one of my questions is, does she not know? Does she not know who he is? D -d does she not know what he's probably done? Does, does she not know the thoughts, the actions, the attitudes of the man? Like, like, like why? <laughs> why would she, a black woman, jump to protect a white racist? Why? Well, she was actually asked this question uh, later, and, and her answer was surprising. She said, well, it just seemed like the Jesus thing to do. She, she said, actually, she, she, she said... That, that, that she, she felt God in that split moment actually leading her to do this. And, and not only, like the more that I think about this, not only was it the Jesus thing uh, to do, it's actually what Jesus did. Like, like you have to understand, Parkwood, like when we look at that photo, like none of us in this room, no matter what your ethnicity is, none of us in this room are Keisha Thomas. Jesus is Keisha Thomas. Jesus is the better Keisha Thomas. We're the rebel on the ground. We are the ones who rebel against God. We are the ones who push against God. We are the ones who deserve nothing other than the beating that's coming. And Jesus is the one who covers us in that moment, even though we don't deserve it. And so David, in the midnight of his soul, he says, here's how I'm going to deal with this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lament. I'm going to be honest. I'm going to bring everything that I have before the Lord. I'm going to give it over to him. But secondly, I'm going to be mindful of who God is. I'm going to remember the facts about who God is. I'm going to let the truth of what I know about God supersede what I feel about God. And what I know about God is that he covers me with his salvation. What I know about God is that he jumped in when I needed it most. He jumped in and saved my life. Parkwood, how do we deal with pain? Number one, we need to be honest with God. Number two, we need to be mindful of God. Number three, and, and I'm going to close with this. I'm not going to talk for long today. Number, number three is 
we need to bring glory to God. Uh, team, you guys can come on back up. We're going to sing in just a moment. The, the last thing Psalm 13 has to show us this morning is that no matter how difficult your season is, praise, worship is always the next step. Always the next step. This is how the psalm ends. He, he says, I will sing the Lord's praise for he has been good to me. <laughs> now it's very important that we understand that when David started writing this psalm, to when David finished writing this psalm, his circumstance didn't change. Okay? David is still in deep pain. David is still in crisis mode, midnight of the soul, life flipped upside down, pain. And he writes, I will praise the Lord because he's been good. To me, Parkwood, when you're in the midst of deep pain, and this is kind of piggybacking on what Pastor Gary was talking about last week, when you're in the midnight of your soul, worship is warfare. Warfare. War let, me, let me say it another way worship is an act of defiance. Let me, let me, let me explain. It, it's actually pretty simple. There's the church. There's God, and there is a war set against God in the church by the devil and all the spiritual forces of evil. The, the same devil that tried to defeat Jesus now wants to defeat you. That dragon who warred in heaven now wars against you. That ancient serpent of old who hates God now hates you. And to worship in the midst of of pain is to actively stand in defiance to the serpent who wants to rob you of joy. You gotta understand this. The devil wants you to be angry. The devil wants you to be outraged just like everybody else. He wants you to look at your circumstance and only at your circumstance. And to worship, to stand with tears rolling down your face. In a season where you have more questions than you have answers. And to stand and to say, I'm going to let what I know about God trump what I feel about God. And because of that, I'm going to praise his name. And when you do that, you are actively standing in defiance to the kingdom of the serpent and equally standing in allegiance to the kingdom of God. Worship is warfare. Can we stand on up? Worship is not just an act of defiance against the devil. Worship is an act of defiance against our cultural currents that want to rip us out to sea. Worship is an act of defiance against our flesh which is always at war with the Spirit of God. Worship is an act of defiance against all of those things that want to rob us of joy. When we worship in the midst of pain, what we're doing is we're, we're, we're proclaiming to Satan and to our circumstances that you will not have the final say. You will not have the final say. Yeah, we can admit, yeah, life hurts. <laughs> like it really hurts. But God heals. And because of that, I'm going to chase after him. I'm going to sing to him. I'm going to praise him. I'm going to worship him. Because he's God. And he alone deserves it. Listen, we're going to... We're going to sing a song that we just sang earlier, Firm Foundation. And I got to be honest, Parkwood, can I just tell you? <laughs> I don't really care if you like this song or not. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> Honestly, I don't even care if the musicians play every single note right or not. Worship. True worship is not based on the quality of musicianship. True worship is based on the faithfulness of God. Yeah. 
And so this morning, if he's been good to you, I'm not asking if you've never walked through a storm, worship, know what I'm saying? If he's been good to you, if he's held you, if he's holding you, then this morning, defy your flesh in worship. Defy the devil in worship. Defy the the culture that says what's happening in here is just weird. Defy it in worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. If you have ever found yourself in a season where where you knew you were the rebel thrown on the ground and Jesus jumped over you to protect you, then worship, lift up your song, lift up your praise and allow God to bring the healing that we need in the midnight of your soul. This is how we deal with the seasons of pain. We're honest, we're mindful, and we worship.